Good day. I am Siobhan Clark Joe, Assistant Commissioner of Innovation for the Office of the Privacy Commissioner for Bermuda. Please join me in thanking our previous panel speakers. Up next, what can DPAs learn from other regulators? The panel will be moderated by Ms. Claudia Berg. The panel will explore the intersection of privacy and other regulatory spheres, such as competition law, to discuss the substantive and perceived tensions and synergies. Without further ado, Ms. Berg, please begin when you're ready. <laughs> but for, for, the, for that reason, I wanted you to sit next to him. <laughs> he's very nice, but he's too large. <laughs> 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 All right, let's get to the All right. So, morning everyone, let's get cracking, because we're running a little bit late, but no worries, just to say, I've, um, I've double-checked, the lunch hour has been extended by 15 minutes, so even if we wrap up only by 12.45, everybody's still got an hour for lunch, just saying. So, welcome everyone um, to this, uh, this session about what, we, what the data protection authorities can learn from other regulators. My name is Claudia Burke. I'm the general counsel um, at the ICO in the UK. Yes, uh, John Edwards is my boss, um, he was just here on the panel. And I've got a really brilliant panel with me today. So where do I start? So I'll do this in speaking order, not order of importance. Um, sorry, Ashkan. Um, so I've got Ashkan Sultani here, who is the executive director of the California Privacy Protection uh, Agency. And you've been there since 2021 and just heard about the exciting startup days in the beginning. That's great. Um, to my left, privacy trail brazer, um, Jessica Rich. She is now at uh, Kelly Dryan Warren as senior counsel, but was previously for many years the FTC's director of the Bureau of Consumer Protection. Uh, and then Anna, um, thanks so much for being with us, special rapporteur uh, for privacy at the United Nations. I think you as well in July 21, you were appointed by the UN Human Rights Council. You're also professor of law at the University of Montevideo. Welcome. And then finally, Ulrich Kalber, the Federal Commissioner for Data Protection in Germany. So today's panel, what's the plan? We've got um, an hour. As the title suggests, we're talking about what data protection authorities can learn from other regulators. And I think we've already just seen you know, how much intersection there is between data protection and other areas of law. So what we're going to do, we've divided the panel broadly into four themes. We'll be speaking about intersection of privacy and competition law. And then we'll be speaking about the potential tension between the right to privacy and the right to free speech. We'll be talking about the intersection of online safety and privacy, and then more broadly about collaboration between regulators and what we can sort of learn from others and how we work best together. So without further ado, Ashkan, uh, let's get started. The first topic will be really about intersection of data protection laws and competition laws. And we heard already on the previous panel there's quite a lot going on, especially at the FTC. So, uh, Ashkan, generally speaking, it often seems that the aims of data protection and competition law are really at odds with, with each other in conflict because um, the privacy guardians like us, we want data to be held safely, potentially in between the walled gardens of big tech, whilst the competition lawyers want data freely accessible to everybody in order to lower barriers to entry for new firms to come in who need access to this data. So, um, Ashkan, what's your take on this? Do you see this in your practice, this tension? Thanks, that's a great question. And thanks, everyone, for um, hearing us out before lunch. Um, so, 
kind of my exposure to this started actually early on at the FTC. I was the chief technologist working with the team that did the Google search um, investigation. That team had worked on a number of other matters. And even prior to um, Chair Simons, there was a big push to try to bring together the competition side of the house as with the consumer protection uh, side of the house just to see those um, tensions as, as um, they exist ripely. I do push back on this general um, kind of notion that in order to have more competition, you have to make the good available to everyone. So we've seen this kind of pretty regularly. You could alternatively just make the good less available to everyone, right? Uh, so that's the other, uh, and, and have an equal playing field in, in that respect. Um, we've seen this kind of flesh out in two areas. So one, we saw um, the federal, uh, federal competition uh, officer, uh, the Bundeskartellamt, but, Excellent. Uh, in in uh, Germany, um, bring a matter with regards to uh, Facebook and their collection of information and combination of information across um, basically information Facebook directly collects from consumers with face the data Facebook collects across its other brands as well as from other websites. Yeah. And um, the uh, um, F uh, head of the FCO said that data is a decisive factor in establishing market power, which the CG, uh, CJEU maintained that the decision um, that competition authorities have the ability to investigate and sanction data practices in consultation with the DPA. So here we see both a recognition that there's an intersection um, uh, between competition and privacy and a recognition that the two authorities should work together. Um, I think. Uh, you know, you know, my understanding is still at the FTC under, mm -hmm. under Lena, uh, almost every matter on the privacy side does still consider the competition aspects as well, and I think that's the right frame. But again, I don't think the necessary frame is to um, make the data more available to everyone or essentially require interoperability. I think there's ways to do this. Um, the, uh, the, the other example to talk about is the um, CMA and UK ICOs, uh, just the kind of um, influence on Google, and uh, so as everyone knows, um, Google in, in their role not only as an um, advertiser, but the creator of um, the Google Chrome uh, browser, which is something like 67% of the market share, last I checked, um, they had announced that in response to privacy laws and just the general trend, they were going to deprecate third-party cookies, which everyone knows third-party cookies are one of the mechanisms by which businesses that are not, um, that the consumer is not directly engaging or interacting with are able to monitor their profile, uh, profile consumers across websites and services. Um, and so uh, kind of inspired by a complaint by a couple of groups <coughs> in the UK, the CMA then consulted with Google and essentially push them to delay this deprecation of cookies uh, and uh, push them to consider exactly the market impacts that removing cookies would uh, have to some of the smaller players. And the, the argument being that, that in order to compete with Google, everyone needs to have uh, they be able to surveil consumers. And again, again, I think here it's still potentially problematic as the alternative would be just to say, and, and had Google concede that they themselves wouldn't have any preferential access to the data they make available through these tools. So not only do they deprecate third-party cookies, but in some of their sandbox and other tools that they're trying to um, promote, that they themselves would withhold exclusive access to that data. And so I think we're, we're having a kind of a wait and see um, approach to it where Google is evaluating and taking stakeholder input to make sure you know, everyone kind of trusts this agreement. But I think if we had some, uh, you know, if we had stronger commitments from the, the, the gatekeepers in this case that they wouldn't preference themselves, I think you'd have equivalent or, or, or as good of an outcome. Thanks, Ashka. And of course, uh, we'll be talking about it in a minute, but in the European Union, um, we now see the Digital Markets Act that, for instance, will um, prohibit self preferencing for certain gatekeepers, some of whom are in the room, I think. Um, so that'll be interesting to see, but let's just circle back to the German Facebook case because I think that's really interesting and given that we're lucky enough to have Ulrich here, so um, what I found interesting in the case, it really is a great example of, you know, how the, well, the, not just the laws intersect, but how actually, practically speaking, you know, the work of regulators, um, you know, intersect. So, uh, 
as Ashkan was saying, so it was quite, I mean, it was ultimately for now, tough, uh, a bumpy ride for the, for the federal uh, cartel office, and it looks like they're winning, given that the European Court of Justice has found in their favor and has, um, I guess, addressed the skepticism that the national court had expressed um, by saying a little bit, like, hang on a minute, isn't this a GDPR case? So what, 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 why are you doing this, uh, federal cartel office? Why aren't the data protections doing this? And I was just wondering, Ulrich, now kudos to the German Competition Authority for taking on the case, but can you give us any insights as to why uh, the German Competition Authority had to step in and take the case rather than a European Data Protection Authority? Oh, that's politically a dangerous <laughs> question. Uh, uh, and to answer it in both ways, politically correct and giving you the facts, uh, <laughs> first of all, the competition authorities and the data protection authorities works very differently in Europe. So uh, on the competition mm -hmm. side, the, the very large cases are handled on the um, level of the European Commission. You remember the fines against Google, Microsoft, or mm -hmm. something. And um, all the different um, competition authorities works very independently mm -hmm. on all cases coming up. At the uh, side of the data protection authorities, we have the one-stop shop. Mm -hmm. with all the benefits of the one-stop shop, like having one face for the uh, processors and one face to maybe to citizens who complain about something so they can communicate with their national authority, even in, the, in their own language and not only in the language of the uh, processor. But that means that you always, well, in the most cases, especially here, you have a leading supervisory authority. And this process, um, had some problems to start in the beginning from 2018. It took some time for having this cross-border important cases um, to have um, decisions on that. Um, the process not only had this idea of uh, communicating between the uh, leading supervisory authority and the concerned supervisory authorities, but uh, if there are different opinions on the case or if issue, parts, uh, issues of the case, then there is a, um, a coherence uh, mechanism to, to find solutions, and maybe at the end with the majority decision in the European Data Protection Board. So it took some time, and uh, Andreas Mund, the head of the Bundeskartellamt and member of the reference panel of the GPA, um, he saw that uh, in the uh, task he has with the Bundeskartellamt of uh, also having an eye on the digital sector of the industry, um, he doesn't want to wait for some decisions coming out of the uh, uh, privacy authorities, so he acted. Uh, he was in touch with the um, DPC in Ireland, and he was uh, in strong coordination with us uh, in, uh, in the city of Bonn. We both uh, uh, have the, um, our headquarters in Bonn, um, and we were strongly supporting the ideas of the uh, competition authorities stepping in, and we uh, shared their opinion about that um, a violation of uh, data protection laws, as, uh, at least if it's su such a long time violation of data protection law, is a sign for a, a market domination uh, of a company so that the competition law itself is on the field. Um, and we were surprised about the first decisions of the national uh, court. <laughs> um, we didn't see a real good explanation for that positioning. Yeah. And uh, so, yes, it was also a day for celebration for us when the uh, decision of the European Court of Justice gave out two things. First, they may step in as a competition authority, and second, good for us, they have to be in close contact with the uh, data protection authorities because at the, at the question, if this is a data protection violation or not, it's our decision, mm -hmm. and they have to have us view on that for their final decision on the case. Yeah, no thanks Ulrich, I, I, I saw this in the judgment that I guess some data protection authorities almost breathe, uh, it was a sigh of relief um, because whilst the Court of Justice ruled in favor of the Bundeskartell and said yes, it's totally fine, you know, when you make your competition law assessment, you're absolutely entitled to look at um, the question of whether or not there's a violation of data protection laws, but, <laughs> but, you know, you are, um, you have to consult with the data production authorities and ultimately it is their view that, that, um, that prevails. Um, so perhaps one final one for you, Ashkan, because what I found interesting about your comments right now was the, you know, was the sort of, um, actually access to data is maybe not such a, a great idea. 
And when we look at um, emerging tech regulation coming out of uh, Brussels, and um, we have some equivalent in, uh, in the United Kingdom, there is now um, uh, you know, the Digital Markets Act. And the Digital Markets Act imposes obligations on gatekeepers. So that's not everybody. It's fair to say it's only um, certain big tech platforms. And the European Commission just a few weeks ago, I think, designated gatekeepers. Um, uh, you know, the usual, I would say, suspects uh, is perhaps one of them. Now, there are rules in there that say, okay, if you are a gatekeeper, you know, you must give um, data subjects and business users, access, give them access to the data that was generated through the use of the platform um, upon request. So, so, but it also <coughs> says, you can see here again, the lawmakers in Brussels working closely together, but it's all subject to GDPR. But that's kind of where it stops. So it's a bit like, you know, so I guess you sit there, and I'm sure there are quite a few people in the room who might be thinking, but what does that mean? So how do you, how do you see that working from a, from a US perspective? I mean, so, if, and I won't speak to the GDPR perspective, but I think you're right in highlighting that, that at least in California, our framework, uh, but also the FTC, you know, we, we our agency focuses sorely, um, primarily on the, on the um, uh, privacy uh, data protection side of things. So, so D uh, California Department of Justice handles more of the competition uh, issues, whereas the FTC handles both competition and um, consumer protection in-house. Um, I do think you know, the question is, how does this framework square with the data minimization pr principles of GDPR is the question you're ultimately asking, as well as the data provenance, whose data are it, whose mm -hmm. data, if the data were not collected by one of the entities who, who uh, has access or rights to it, and who is the kind of the data controller in some sense. Um, I, don't, I think that's probably a better question for someone that knows the, um, the GDPR framework. In California, the, the, essentially the framework is a little bit about consumers and the businesses with which they intend to interact. And so that framework specifically lays out who consumers believe they're interacting with, and it doesn't have this kind of joint controller, multi-controller. It has kind of a, on a per I interaction basis this concept of consumers knowingly interacting with a platform, and the platform may in fact have service providers that are under contractual obligations similar to processors and, and, and um, GDPR, but that, that lineage or that chain is kind of very visible and it's very consumer focused. So, um, so I, we haven't had a decision that says like, oh, and make sure the platforms make it available to everyone. We do see some tensions around like, um, for public good efforts and for kind of um, the state itself wanting to, to receive data for planning and such. But we've seen that historically work through de-aggregate or de-identified data, so mm -hmm. in analytics, not individually identified data. Um, so perhaps that's how it could take root in, yeah. in the UK, which is that you can essentially benefit or the public can benefit from the insights without necessarily making it individually um, uh, kind of harmful to, 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 to mm -hmm the data subjects. Oh, thank you. Well, I, I think we've seen that um, there's quite a lot of um, inter interplay between competition law, data protection law, and that there's um, a huge amount of collaboration going on. In the UK, we've got the Digital Regulation Corporation Forum, as was mentioned on the previous panel, where we work closely with other regulators, such as the Competition Authority. Now, in the, uh, the European courts have found there might actually be a duty to consult, um, almost, between competition and um, and data protection authorities. And I just wonder, before we move on to our second theme, does anyone have any questions for Ashkan on the panel or any thoughts um, on the, not yet? I have a question on another Later. topic. Later. <laughs> Hopefully it's a zinger, but it probably <laughs> isn't. He's gotten all the questions he's ever going to get. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. OK, brilliant. Well, let's move on to sort of, we've got uh, another theme, as I was saying, which was, again, playing a little bit with you know potential tension, synergies between various areas of law, and we've picked one that I think is very, very topical right now, and Jessica has very kindly agreed to lead us through this, which is the tension between two very, very important fundamental rights, the right to privacy and the right to free speech, free expression. And I guess the key question for all of us here on the panel and everyone in the room is, so we like both, so can we have it all? Um, and um, Jessica, I was wondering, critics have said that um, in America there was, there's perhaps a bit of a journey towards what's been called First Amendment expansionism, and some might say fetishism. Um, can you tell us a little bit about recent developments in the, in the US about this kind of clash between First Amendment and privacy? So I'd love to, and um, it's great to be here with old friends and new old friend. Um, 
and that's the way privacy is. So uh, we all know that. Um, so um, th um, you know, I want to talk today, as you said, about the tensions between um, privacy, safety, mm -hmm. and Coming. free speech. And it's very much heating up in the US today. Um, and what's in particularly interesting is that some of the work that the US has been doing in this area comes right from Europe. And Europe isn't having the same kind of struggles with it that we are. So I think there's some interesting, um, some interesting lessons and interplay here. And I'm sure Ashkan especially is going to jump in on this because it's affecting his, his work directly. Mm -hmm. um, so um, as background, as all of you know, many privacy, there's a lot of privacy laws on the books in the US. I'm not saying they're adequate, but there's a lot of them that have gone largely unchallenged as a legal matter for quite a long time now. COPPA, Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, is a longstanding US law protecting kids. This was enacted in 1998. It protects young children under 13. Um, and it's enforced at the federal and the state level. And um, it, it has basic privacy, you know, parental consent for uh, uh, collection of uh, data from kids under 13. It's got. Um, access and deletion right for parents, some more substantive protections as well. And it's fairly, been fairly non-controversial because it's focused on young kids and primarily on data collection. Um, other privacy laws have been implemented and enforced in the US that have, have had a similar experience, um, applicable to not just kids but adults. The Fair Credit Reporting Act imposes uh, privacy and accuracy requirements on companies that sell consumer reports. Graham Leach Bliley um, has, uh, opt out for uh, sharing with third parties uh, in the financial market. Um, the FTC, um, as many people know here, has used the FTC Act to challenge a range of practices uh, involving privacy and security, deceptive privacy statements, weak data security, spyware, using and selling data for fraud. There's laws governing spam and unwanted telemarketing. There's data breach laws in 50 states and additional you know, territories. And we now have comprehensive laws in 12 states, although the jury is still out on how those will fare in the courts and in, in, in the public mindset. Um, these laws are generally viewed as protecting both privacy and safety without much conflict. If you protect people's data, you protect them from unwelcome contacts, stalking, identity theft, fraud, and it's especially important for children. Mm -hmm. um, but into this scheme, um, largely modeled on the UK's um, age-appropriate design code, have come new efforts to protect minors up to 18. This is in the US now. Um, um, that includes teens now. Um, from harmful content, not just data collection, um, which is different. Um, several states have passed laws requiring social media companies to determine users' age and then screen minors from harmful content like bullying, self-harm, addictive features, violence, um, much like the UK code. Other states have passed laws requiring parental consent before minors can even use social media. And there's been similar efforts at the, at the federal level, which have been progressing, although they, they haven't passed. Um, I'm sure some of you are following that, COSA and the CSAM Act. Um, these laws are much more controversial than the privacy laws we've had on the books, because they cover not just kids, uh, small children, but teens, who are thought to have a lot more autonomy and rights than, um, than young children. Um, they create obstacles to accessing content for all users, or at least that's what um, some have argued, um, both harmful and non-harmful, because you've got age verification and you've got some obstacles to accessing content for both kids and adults now. They raise difficult challenges regarding age verification, which we all know is tremendously challenging. Um, and they create the fears that, um, Sensitive content that teens want um, about sexuality, um, sexual identity, reproductive health issues could be branded as harmful by certain actors who view it as harmful and thus blocked. So, uh, and, and finally, they raised, I'm sure there's many other points, they raised fears that 
if there's duties to screen, con to know what content, like a platform is providing to users, that will undermine encryption because the platform has to like view the content. And so they can't just say, oh, it's encrypted. So it's gonna undermine encrypt encryption. So as a result, these laws have understandably been opposed by industry, by industry, but also many um, uh, consumer advocacy organizations. Not all, there's, there's, a, there's a split. And they're having trouble in the course. So just to take um, a, the one case study, but there are others, and this is one that's, that Oshkan was ready to enforce, but now it's on hold. Are you, weren't you gonna enforce we, we that? Don't, yeah, we don't have enforcement of AADC. Well, good thing, because you're not enforcing it anyway. Um, <laughs> you're not missing so out. Not, <laughs> yeah, um, sorry, but you're still very um, interested in this, I know. Um, so um, the California Age Appropriate Code, which is similar to the UK's, it, you know, has a lot of things in it. Um, but it requires that uh, any business that offers products and services that minors under 18 are likely to access, likely to access, must perform uh, data impact assessments to identify and mitigate harm to minors, many kinds of harms, collection, data collection, harmful content, profiling, targeted advertising, addictive features, other things. They gotta estimate age of users with reasonable certainty um, or apply the same protections to all users. They've gotta configure minors' default settings to the highest level of privacy and they can't engage in knowing, uh, knowingly harmful uses of minors' information. And what a court did, and this was a judge appointed, was it under Obama? Um, which really surprised a lot of people, the Democratic um, president, um, struck down the, the, the whole thing, basically, except for a few little pieces, um, as a violation of First Amendment in remarkably sweeping terms, saying the purpose of the act to protect kids online was important, is important, but the act's provisions were vague, they chill access to content, both adults and children's, and, not, and they aren't supported by evidence. And what's very significant is the court didn't just target the provisions limiting access to content, but went well beyond and struck down aspects of the law that we regard as fairly basic to data protection, both here and in Europe. Mm -hmm. So the uh, the data privacy impact assessment wasn't targeted properly, the harm identified and the evidence wasn't there. The age estimation requirement requires the collection of more data that, to, to estimate age and uh, impedes the free speech of both adults and kids. The highest default settings requirement, the harmful data uses requirement, the dark patterns prohibition, vague, struck it down as vague, not targeted. The ban on profiling minors and engaging in unnecessary data collection may cut off content minors want, targeted content. And the ban on secondary use of information wasn't supported by evidence. What's the evidence that secondary use of information is bad for you? Um, and um, the list goes on. So um, that's likely gonna be appealed, I assume, although I haven't seen a notice of it, but um, there's been some other rulings. I'm using up too much time now, but there's been some other rulings of a similar nature in the U.S., striking down, for example, the, um, the ban on social media um, uh, per, uh, per permission for the requirement that parents give permission before um, uh, kids under 18 can even access social media. That was struck down. Uh, in, in, in a similar way, and there was a, a recent hearing on a ban of TikTok uh, in Montana, was it? Uh, un for under 13, that looks like it's on thin ice based on the hearing. So these are very, very interesting developments going on in the mm -hmm. US where, where the First Amendment is de definitely being used in a very robust manner, um, and there are likely lessons for Europe, even though Europe mm -hmm. isn't having Absolutely. the same um, uh, issues in the courts. No, it's, it's um, fascinating. And do you think in terms of, well, so when I looked at this, well, well, I mean, it's, as you said, it's a pretty seismic uh, development. And do you think 
that the main driver? Was that really the first amendment or was it the lack of clarity? So I wasn't, when I was looking through, I was a bit like, I kind of, I kind of, you know, I can see why maybe at least certain provisions, I can see that maybe, you know, um, a judge would kind of think that that's just a bit too vague, but I wasn't quite clear. What do you think was driving what was really the, at the forefront of the judge's mind? Was it more First Amendment vagueness or a bit of both? I think it's a pretty vague statute um, mm -hmm. if you read it. Um, I think the fact that it targeted content got the judge upset, mm -hmm. but then she went after all of it. So maybe if it had been more of a privacy law, of course we have one, mm -hmm. um, but if it had been more of a limited to privacy, it wouldn't have ended up being challenged in court. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the judge wouldn't have looked at it and said, oh my God, you know, what, what, what are all these prohibitions? But all of those things got her into it mm -hmm. and then she took it all apart. Mm -hmm. But it's a vague law. Okay, no, I, I can see. But so is the UK's. Uh, yes, but, um, but I hasten <laughs> has to say the, the UK Age of Appropriate Design Code is the name, uh, says uh, what's in the tin, it's a code. So it's more like guidance to us rather than a statute. So I think um, uh, perhaps there's a lesson there. I mean, I don't, I, you know, as I said, it's kind of like it's not, uh, you know, if th this is not something that Parliament has decided to put on the statute book. It's more a guidance, you know, to companies how to best comply with the law. But ultimately, it's still all about the law. So I think there's a difference here. But um, um, so I was just wondering, any thoughts on the panel? So maybe. Um, um, Anna, do you have, I know you are here and give us a global perspective on things, which is brilliant, given that this is a, a global event. And I just wondered, listening to sort of Jessica right now, I think it's often said in America where California goes, so does the nation, which uh, uh, as a UN special rapporteur, do you have concerns about these developments, um, such as, you know, blocking the California age appropriate design calls, or what's sort of your global perspective? Um, of course, I'm worried Thank about you. it, uh, and I don't have a position adopted at this moment. Mm. Um, but I would begin. I would like to begin saying thank you. Thank you for the opportunity of being in this panel with such an important people. And thank you to um, the organizers of this event for making it possible that I'm here now in this wonderful part of the world. Um, what I think is that uh, nowadays, uh, nobody can live isolated. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that we all uh, live immersed in a society. I think that uh, the, the sort of problems that appeared now happened before. I mean, um, we used to have uh, the geographical disorientation with uh, international data transfers, and then the solutions came. Um, there were lots of things that had been done. Some went well, some didn't go as well, but we came on. Now I think we are immersed in a different reality. It's a bit different, but it's not so different as I feel. Because that was, uh, had the focus on geography, and this has the focus on uh, the topics that are involved in our problems, let's call it that some way. And I mean, we have to deal with the intersection of data protection and competition, data protection and um, a press and, and freedom of, ex of expression. Uh, we also have data protection and security, safety. It's all a great mess. <laughs> it's quite complicated, <laughs> oh, and now we have also uh, IP, mm -hmm. so course. we have lots of things to be done. But well, I don't have solutions, that's the, the right, I, I don't have them. I would like to see them, but what I only have is ideas, and I think that of course we should work together. And I think that of course we should work in the lines of uh, generating guidelines, generating um, compliance tools, technical experts, um, uh, just uh, thinking uh, in a broad way and looking for the way of going out of the problem. But 
always with a global sense, because these are global problems. I, I always insist in this, this topic. These are global problems. So the fact is that we have to focus globally. We have to be always in, uh, in an ambience of multi-stakeholders. Uh, everybody has to be represented. Everybody has to feel that if his or her opinion are there. And then we need to generate documents that will be respected for all. And the same that happened with, with the geographical aspect is going to happen in this. So um, I had a lot of words that I wanted to tell you, but uh, I think I told you the, the, the basis. And uh, I, I'd like to finish with an invitation to work together mm -hmm. in those topics that are complicating our day-by-day day day life and to see if we can have some documents that are good for everybody. No, thanks, Anna. When you say sort of, you know, they're global issues, I mean, I think we, we, we all appreciate this given not least the nature of data and how it just flows freely around the globe, which is a good thing and sometimes um, not such a good thing. But how do you think you know, specifically the cooperation. What, what kind of what kind of forum would you have? Forums would you have in mind, and everyone else on the panel as well? How do you see this? Do you see this more as bilateral? Do you see it as you know part of GPA, maybe OECD? These organisations. <laughs> How do we best work together um, to address those those issues within data protection, but also with the other regulators? <laughs> Claudia, I think we did them all. <laughs> <laughs> I really think so. We did them all. <laughs> everybody is important. Everybody has to yeah. to let us know their opinion, yeah. so, yeah. Ulrich, right. do you have any, you have got a lot of experience, I think, with international cooperation. Do you have any thoughts on what Anna was just saying? Yeah, the, the, the first thing is to do your homework. Mm -hmm. So, uh, inspired by the work of our friends from the UK, we are these days um, working on, um, yeah, on these issues uh, in a subgroup of the European Data Protection Board with the uh, colleagues from Italy as the driving force there, and to have a common position of this group of 32. Um, and um, part of this um, project is uh, listening to other uh, regulators, to politics, to civil society, because I see uh, a lot of uh, limits for a technical solution of that problem. Mm -hmm. And what's your, um, you know, in terms of specifics, do you think that we've got enough fora, or do you think, like, for example, as I was saying, you know, we've got a, um, the Digital Regulators Corporation Forum, which is really, you know, as John was saying earlier, it's got, you know, a telecoms regulator, a competition authority, it's got the data protection authority, and our financial conduct authority, and at least, you know, it's not, it's not a thing in the sense it's not a, an entity, it's not an organization, it's not going to investigate, but it is a great forum for just sitting down and discussing some of these issues that we've been discussing on the panel. Do you think that's um, a good idea? Well, of course, the FTC, for instance, is an example of an agency that had, has um, a number of those powers in-house, which is uh, one way of doing it. Um, what, what do you think? What are the sort of best ways in terms of cooperating? And from my perspective, there are two less for us for uh, institutions which are already there to mm -hmm. exchange on a global level or uh, intra-regional uh, uh, level. There are uh, political institutions like the United Nations or G7, G20, um, where uh, this side of the uh, debate is trying to uh, point at certain issues. But for example, where is the fora for competition authorities and data protection authorities mm -hmm. and, and others to, to exchange. The idea of the reference panel of the GPA was to have others um, giving us some assistance of uh, on what topics we are working, what is the importance of the work we are doing, is there a gap between the things we are discussing to the, to the way they are discussed outside of our bubble. Um, so. Um, we should strengthen mm -hmm. such um, um, ideas and uh, finding uh, for us for this exchange with others. Mm -hmm. No, that makes good sense. And do you think from a sort of US perspective, what's your view on a sort of cross-agency? Obviously, FTC is a, an easy example, but what's your view on sort of cross-agency collaboration? Yeah, and so um, I think our, particularly in California, um, we're a little unique is that our statute uh, essentially requires us to work uh, with other 
um, both California agencies, but we, uh, as well as other um, national and even international regulators to promote consistency and application of the law. So we very actively, my head of policy, Maureen Mahoney, is here, if you haven't said hi to her. Um, we very actively engage with um, a number of the other state regulators in Calif you know, California. We were first, but we have you know, Colorado, Connecticut, a number of other states that follow similar models. So we're in close consultation with other privacy regulators, but we also certainly talk to other regulators generally. Um, across uh, across the U.S., including, um, you know, I have a, now a huge team of economists because that's part of the rulemaking process for California as well. Um, and I will flag one thing in Europe that I've seen is, and I, I know I saw him earlier, Gwendol Legrand at ADPB is trying to also promote kind of a, kind of a technical um, coordination across DPAs, which I think is really important to have the same kind of understanding, technical um, expertise, and knowledge level mm -hmm. um, on probably on both the privacy issues, but likely just the technology and competition issues as well. Um, and I know in um, the U.S. we have the National Association of AGs, so the attorney generals from all the states regular come together. And I used to prior to this job also be an expert to them, mm -hmm. who look at and 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 take um, take a kind of um, more sophisticated understanding of how things work. So I think there's like a bunch of forum, um, not too explicit on a particular topic, but I think that's good because they can be dynamic. You know, like generative AI, and literally now there's a hundred fora on generative AI. There, <laughs> there wasn't a formal one set up because it was just a new emerging topic that everyone's interested in, and next year it will be something different. Jessica, you want so to come in I'll on I'll bring the historical perspective, mm -hmm. as I always like to do. So I worked on privacy from the late 90s to, well, I still work on it, but at the FTC from the late 90s to uh, 2017 as a, um, a, as a regulator, as an, an enforcer in privacy, and the progress that was made in communications internationally during those years was incredible. Now, the FTC has an office that's specifically dedicated to that, and of course, Commissioner Slaughter would know you know, better than I do right now what, what, what's happening right now. But I remember early meetings where we went um, to meet with, with DPAs. Peter Shaw, do you remember, was screaming at me. <laughs> what a, a, like, ban you know, terrible, the U.S. is terrible, you're not doing anything. And, you know, of course, I had no sleep because I'd done a, an overnight, you know, so it was very unpleasant. Um, <laughs> but um, the, I think the mutual appreciation, even though the U.S. doesn't have adequacy, um, between the, um, the, the continents um, is, is much greater. There's many more points of coordination. You've now got 12 states with privacy laws who are, all, especially California, specific, also engaging directly with Europe, and the progress has been ama you know, amazing, so we should just count, you know, assume the trajectory is going to keep going forward in terms of sharing. Warwick, do you want to... As a lawyer, right? Peter is my predecessor. I, I have to apologize for uh, <laughs> the typical German rudeness. So, you know, when, when, when uh, my British colleague would say, I, I agree to, with you up to one point, the German would say, that was the greatest nonsense I ever heard. <laughs> um, the, the, the importance of the uh, of the U.S. market for the for the platforms and, um, and is so high that we really have a, a, a high interest in what's going on. Um, the the point I see, and I'm a computer scientist from mm -hmm. profession, is um, I never saw a real convincing technical solution for this. Um, in the end, too much um, surveillance would endanger the privacy um, of those we want to protect. And uh, that was at the beginning, which could be uh, blocked, for example, information. So uh, in the end, this could not only be um, a technical or data privacy solution. There has to be much more to contribute to that uh, aim of uh, giving a safe space for our kids. Thank you. And then maybe um, just one sort of um, final discussion around the topic of sort of enforcement and um, you know what can we learn from other agencies? What can we learn from other jurisdictions? So what matters? Because yesterday uh, evening it was very interesting. 
um, to listen to uh, the panel that was uh, moderated by Stuart Dresner on you know, what's going on in the Caribbean. I found that very fascinating. And um, you know, there was, I think there was you know, a short discussion also around enforcement and you know, people saying, look, do you know what? We've got a lot of issues <laughs> that we need to sort out at the same time, so we can't do everything. Now, if we now turn to our panel, so I think, for instance, in the US, um, how do you see, what, what really matters in terms of enforcement? How do you see also the roles, the respective roles of the FTC versus the states? <coughs> what makes enforcement effective, Jessica? I think that's one for you to lead on. <laughs> well, um, I actually, I think things are kind of messy right now in the United States between the FTC, the failure of leadership in Congress, the 12 states, we're, we're in, we're all, we're figuring it out where the states are, are, are filling a vacuum that lack of federal leadership has created, not at the FTC, but in, in Congress where the, the law is, needs to be changed and it has needed to be changed for over 20 years. Um, um, but um, there's a balance between law and enforcement. Mm -hmm. And um, the EU is stronger on having a consistent law, like regardless of what you think of the GDPR and its, it, its strengths and its weaknesses, there, it's a law that people look to for guidance. And I would say the FTC, um, well, the US and not just the FTC, but now the states too, is still way stronger on enforcement. I mean, no comparison, and I'm not talking in the competition area, which I'm less familiar with, but on consumer protection. The FTC with its 50 at most dedicated staff have brought just hundreds of privacy cases, um, some with very significant remedies uh, that the commissioner was talking about in the earlier panel. Mm -hmm. um, and with you know, uh, substantial injunctive monetary relief, you've got recent cases against Facebook and Equifax and Epic Games and Google and Twitter, and the FTC's got every, every um, practically every platform under order now. Um, you've got now states um, coming up and, and starting to exercise their might, and in the US, you know, any of these enforcement entities can bring actions as long as it touches their citizens as opposed to it being localized depending on where the company is in, 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 in Europe. Um, but there's an irony because part of the strength that the um, FTC has developed in enforcement is because we haven't, we haven't had a US law. So I was there, we had to be scrappy. Okay, what do we have? We've got the FTC Act. Um, we've got a bunch of these sectoral laws. Let's be as aggressive as possible in enforcing them. And we had, had developed an enforcement muscle almost because mm -hmm. we did not have the luxury of being able to say, hey, look at that law that clearly says X, Y, and Z. So both are important. You need to have clear standards. You need to have enforcement. I think the, F the US is still stronger on enforcement, less strong on clear standards. EU is stronger on standards, but not always so clear. There's some vague <laughs> terms in them. Um, but we can learn a lot from each other. No, that's brilliant. So two quick fire. One was a uh, trick fire question. There. So what's the, what was the secret in developing uh, that uh, muscle? I mean, probably spend a few hours in the gym. So let's, t let's tell us what that gym looks like. And then secondly, you spoke about almost that the, the lack of standards was, you know, sort of propulsed you into action because you had to be. But so w w where's the legal certainty for business then in the US? Um, where does, and especially if there are a lot of settlements. So those two, for both of you, of course. Um, I think the companies would argue there isn't legal certainty in the US between the FTC exercising the FTC Act, sometimes in predictable ways and sometimes in novel ways, which it has to do and which is how the FTC Act was designed. Mm -hmm. um, and then you've got all these states now coming in with similar laws. They're all modeled after you, but they're different. They're a little different. So I think, um, I think that um, companies would argue there isn't a lot of uh, legal certainty, and, um, and I think they're right. I think we're still evolving, evolving. but we just talked, you talked about last night the, um, 
the uh, Caribbean countries, they're evolving too, and mm. we're, we're a little further on mm. in that journey, but we're still evolving. In terms of settlements, um, I think the settlements, they're not legal, they're not um, litigated cases, but they provide a lot of guidance, and I think companies have uh, looked to them as being precedential. Okay, no, that's good. People might argue with me out there. But, absolutely, um, we'll, ag yeah. we'll, argue, we'll argue over lunch yeah. in a minute, absolutely. Ashkan, do you want to add to that in terms no, of think, effective think, enforcement from the US perspective? What, I, how do we co cooperate, what can we learn? I mean, I think the point that Jessica made is sound, that we have um, you know, a, a number of uh, implementations uh, of, kind of, a, a kind of general principle that California started um, and you have kind of an overlay just uh, kind of the FTC Act and even UDAP and, and states of just unfair and deceptive trade practices as a, as a backstop for new and emerging, uh, emerging kind of things that, that um, existing privacy laws don't cover. Even, even in the multiple state implementations, I would argue Europe has a similar model where you have the GDPR, but you have different member states kind of doing different, different focus, different interpretations, different um, implementations. Um, and I think kind of in a rapidly emerging technologically advanced space, you want that. You want a little bit of flexibility. You want a little bit of um, experimentation. Mm -hmm. You want the laboratories of democracy to be able to um, try and address some of these novel problems that are very difficult, right? So AI, like, was not something that a lot of the privacy laws were designed to address, right? But there now everyone's trying to figure out, are they sufficient, or do we need something totally different to address those? Mm -hmm. And I think that's right. Uh, you know, we have 50, you just said, just started, we have 51 data broker laws, right, in the States, or 50 data broker laws, and people make it work. We have now 12 or 13, if you count Florida, or 14 if you count Washington <laughs> State, because it's kind of a privacy law, yeah. even though it's not. Uh, uh, and, but they all have a lot of the same frameworks. They have definitions of PI, they have definitions of kind of duties of care with regards to notice and with regards to um, you know, denimization, and some of them have cures, some of them don't. But ultimately, they're kind of the same building blocks, and we're just trying to figure out how to stack the Legos. But at the end of the day, we've said that at least in these states, privacy is an important right. Consumers should have some ability to exercise it. Not all obligations should fall on consumers. Businesses have some obligations too, and let's figure this out. That's kind of the framework, and I think um, it's, it's working, particularly because this, you know, uh, to your point, 10 years ago, none of this existed in the US, right? And 20 years ago, none of this existed in Europe. Thank you. So I, I think I have to, before we open up for questions, one uh, last opportunity to Anna and Ulrich to come in on this, how important is enforcement? And also, Ulrich, Jessica has thrown down the gauntlet, hmm? I yeah, think, here, that. quite effectively, okay. saying, you look, start. you know, the US is so much further down on the journey of enforcement. Um, so how do you see, um, you know, how, how do you take up that challenge? How's the effective enforcement of the GDPR going in Europe? I mean, we've seen some recent developments, so I think uh, there's some catching up. But what, what's your view in response? And then, Anna, if you want to come in. Uh, on the one side, the uh, European Data Protection Board is a small GPA with the 32 of us, uh, 27 member states, the European Data Protection Supervisor, the Commission, and three mm -hmm. countries of the EEA. Uh, and additional um, observers. Um, on the other side, um, we have um, binding positioning for everybody. So the, in the moment, uh, our expert subgroups or the uh, coordination process uh, on the cross-border case finds an end. There is a legally binding positioning for all of Europe, which is good for the processors and which is good for the citizens. So um, the speeding up of that process of finding um, solutions for the most important cases, which then can be a blueprint for, for other cases. You don't have to 10 times to investigate, uh, which is the balance between uh, consent and contract, or what, what is the legitimate interest or not. Uh, but you have to find it once. To speed that up, we. Um, we found to, we call it the Vienna process because we met in Vienna, wonderful city. I oh, know, I think Andrea um, Jelinek yeah, had a yeah, say in that. Sure. Um, <laughs> and um, trying to, to really find out what are the most important cases, mm -hmm. strategic cases, and then speed up for them. Mm -hmm. Even without uh, having, if we don't have enough resources for all the cases, to really focus um, on that with more information for the concerned supervisory authorities on the way. So 
uh, we find an idea of uh, what are the right things to investigate, what are the first findings, and not to have that process at the end of the, um, of the decision. I think this can um, accelerate all this stuff, mm -hmm. and now the pipeline is filled with a number of these cases. So if there is mm -hmm. enough political pressure on us, and enough pressure from inside, we will see a number of these cases coming out. Mm -hmm. And I personally, I, I don't see any problem with, uh, or I even I'm in favor of uh, competition authorities, of civil society mm -hmm. uh, organizations going to court or doing their own stuff, of bringing up all the important things. Um, the field is wide enough for uh, certain different uh, actors, so there's no thing of trying to, to cover up but really opening this. And this is the same for the GPA. We, are, we developed so far from 1979. We are a network of networks. Mm -hmm. uh, we're doing this with regional groups, with linguistic groups, with technical groups like the Berlin one. So um, the idea of that we are maybe uh, one crystallization point for this uh, interconnection with other groups, with other authorities, with other regulators, with the civil society, um, with maybe some progressive companies, um, this would be a good attempt for the GBA. Oh, thank you. That's almost a, a great, uh, you know, final, uh, final conclusion. So, Anna, do you want to add anything in terms of globally speaking? You know, we've heard last night and we've heard now here that, you know, the data protection authorities, you know, you know, there's different priorities, different journeys towards effective enforcement. How do you, do you, do you have any thoughts um, on that? I really feel there are different positions. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to feel too that there is one important position for all over the different position, and that should be the intention to cooperate. Mm -hmm. So I won't say nothing more than that. <laughs> and, and I feel great if we can begin the process. It won't be an easy process, but it's yeah. good if we can see it working. Oh, no, brilliant. I think um, cooperation leads me neatly to just saying we have got a few moments um, for questions from the audience before we're <laughs> supposed to wrap up um, and go for lunch. So if anyone's got a question for any of our panelists, then please now, although it's kind of hard to see. They're hungry. Um, are you all very, very hungry? Oh. Is everyone hungry? Okay, brilliant. We're hungry too. So, um, there's um, we got ah, a there's one. Yeah. Oh, there's two. Yeah, sold to the highest bidder. <laughs> so I'm Stuart Dresler from Privacy Laws and Business. Thank you for your kind comments on our session in Caribbean yesterday. My question to the panel is, do you think Matt Schrems and none of your business, NOYB, is doing a good job acting as a, using a private right of action? And do you think it's an important part of the ecosystem? Excellent question. So hands up. I, I, I could go for show of hands, but maybe that's not quite fair. Any any thoughts? Is um, is um, is he an act uh, a uh, good advocate? I think testing right? systems to make sure their sound is good. That's okay. all I'll say on that. Yeah. And any any on this side? Is Mark Schrems a good advocate? Poor Max. Yes. <laughs> Okay, excellent. Well, that was that was very unequivocal. We like that, and I have to say that was Ulrich. You might get the record for the shortest, uh, for the yeah. quickest answer in the whole in the whole event, which is which is brilliant. There was one other question, I think. No, no came. more. Okay, excellent. Well, do you know what? Let's all go for lunch. But let me first thank Alex and thank this wonderful panel for this session, and thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good day, I'm David D'Souza, Compliance and Risk Officer for the Privacy Commissioner of Bermuda. Um, please join me in thanking our fantastic speakers. Uh, genuine food for thought, for sure.